So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting us. Uh, very happy to present here. And uh, like uh, Bill just mentioned a minute ago, uh, there, there's a lot more push these days to, uh, to add more spectroscopy to the microscope. And uh, in this case here, we're talking about the, the scanning probe microscope and, uh, and spectroscopy. So um, I'll uh, mostly go over what uh, we've been working on and what we've done to uh, make the technique uh, work better. So I want to go over, uh, first of all, why TERS, why t penance raman spectroscopy, what is it and what, uh, what, uh, why are we excited about this technique? Um, the t penance raman basics, because uh, I'm not sure that everyone uh, knows how that, that uh, uh, functions. And uh, the core of the presentation will be about uh, optimizing for the near-field uh, optical uh, spectroscopy uh, couplings between AFM or scanning probe microscopy and uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, confocal Raman spectroscopy. And uh, I'll finish with uh, uh, the latest results uh, in terms of uh, TERS imaging. So why TERS? Why t penance Raman uh, scattering or spectroscopy? Uh, so Raman, like uh, Julio uh, explained a bit earlier, um, is a very interesting technique that gives very uh, specific chemical information. Uh, but the spatial resolution is that uh, of the diffraction limit of light. Uh, so basically, Raman is able, uh, here I'm guessing a lot of you guys uh, work on nanomaterials. So Raman is able to detect signal from nano objects like carbon nanotubes, graphene, uh, uh, quantum dots, I mean, things like that, uh, we can see with Raman, but it's not possible to resolve those objects, meaning a nanotube that's about a nanometer in size, you won't be able to see uh, a, an image that is showing the, the size of that nanotube, but you can see uh, the, the spectrum of it. Um, so that's the, the major limitation today to go look at nanomaterials is the, the diffraction limit. The scanning probe microscope techniques can provide many uh, physical properties uh, like uh, um, adhesion, um, deformation, energy dissipation, uh, things like that, um, electrical properties, conductivity, capacitance, uh, magnetic properties, etc. But it's not uh, very chemically specific. In some cases, you can see contrast between different chemical species, but you can't really identify them. So, um, in terms of uh, super resolution techniques, I mean, there's been techniques to push optical microscopy further than the diffraction limit. They are called super resolution techniques, like uh, PALM, which is uh, photo activated uh, um, localization microscopy, or STORM, uh, like stochastic uh, reconstruction microscopy. So, these techniques are allowing a uh, regular confocal microscope to generate images uh, that are uh, further than the diffraction limit and down to about 30 nanometers in resolution. But all these techniques are based on, uh, first of all, they're mostly used in biology and they're used to uh, using fluorescent labels. So um, to, to get to that kind of resolution, it makes heavy use of specific labels that are blinking and then you can you can uh, get an image of uh, different uh, single molecules. The dyes are specific to the molecules, so you can that way uh, target specific uh, chemical species, but you have to have those dyes in, in the sample or look at a sample that has some kind of fluorescence to be able to, to get there. So Tipen and Sraman uh, really uh, brings the prospect of label free, so without dyes. Uh, chemical imaging uh, at the nanoscale. And this is a, a quick uh, example of uh, um, uh, some spectra of uh, a, a long uh, DNA strand, actually RNA strand in this case, and, uh, and uh, using t penance Raman. So let's go over the, the basics, how does that work? So we talked about Raman. Uh, spectroscopy, so it's a combination of various techniques and effects. So there's actually two techniques, scanning probe microscopy, which provides uh, the, 
the near field, if you want uh, probing, uh, giving the spatial resolution of the technique by uh, 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 scanning the sample and scanning a, a tip across the sample, and so the imaging capability by scanning. The, uh, the main effect that is in use here is surface plasma on resonance, where we basically use a specific uh, coating that uh, provide, uh, uh, let's say, uh, allow the surface plasma on resonance, and uh, that special enhancement is necessary because the Ram Raman scattering is very weak. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, ENSOM, uh, the near field scanning optical microscopy, so it gives you a very high uh, spatial resolution for optical microscopy. And you would say, well, why not do Raman this way? Send the laser through uh, an aperture and collect the light and uh, hopefully get a Raman spectrum. Uh, many people have tried this in the past and uh, it's only worked on very strong scatterers. It doesn't really work on regular samples. So in order to achieve um, Raman scattering at the nanoscale, we use, uh, we have to use some sort of enhancement of that Raman signal. And that's where the surface plasma resonance is critical. Um, it is in this case called aperture-less near field optical scanning microscopy because we don't need an aperture, but only the tip is coated with a metal that, that uh, promotes that enhancement. So optical, again, spectroscopy is the, the last part of the, the system where the Raman is really the, the spectrometer, is the, the sensor, if you want, on a, on a typical uh, scanning probe microscope. You read a lot of signals, typically their voltages, and uh, you display those to get, you know, uh, image of the topography, uh, scanning the, the, the Z uh, dimension, or electrical signals, etc. Here, in this case, we have a, a spectrum as our signal. So we have a, a full spectrum at each point, and we generate what we call hyperspectral images. So an image that is built from a spectrum at each data point. And Raman, just to, uh, to uh, summarize again, in case you... Uh, you didn't follow the previous presentation, uh, it provides you with very specific chemical information because it, it, uh, it um, promotes the, the, or detects the vibrations in, in molecular bonds. So stretching, symmetric, asymmetric, bending, etc. So it's very specific to the molecule, even a very complex molecule. If one branch is in one direction versus another, if a ring is at a different place, uh, it will show dif differently in the Raman spectrum. So it's very specific. So to uh, achieve the enhancement, we need a functionalized probe. So uh, it's used to scan the sample and it's acting as a plasmodic antenna. Uh, basically, that's what generates the enhancement. Uh, I will not explain all the details of the probe manufacturing. I mean, this is actually the key part of TERS, but it's, uh, it's also a fairly uh, uh, complex uh, problem, I would say. But there's a lot of publication from people who are successful making those probes. And uh, this is kind of a picture of how uh, uh, the tip of the probe looks like when it's coated with the metal to, uh, to achieve the um, the coupling of the photon into the plasmon and generate the plasmon resonance. So the Raman signal is enhanced by the surface plasmon resonance effect, which is only uh, basically where the tip is near the contact with the sample. So at the, the very tip of uh, the very end of the tip, which means that just a few nanometers in size, is where we get a huge enhancement of the Raman signal. So that Raman signal that only comes from that very tiny spot is if it's strong enough, if the contrast is, is high enough, will basically show in the far field, and that's what we are detecting. So here we have a, an example of a, a spectrum when the tip is up, we see a little spectrum from the far field, and uh, when the tip is down, so when the tip is close to the sample, then we have the enhancement and the resonance effect which promotes the, the, the signal only from that location. And by scanning the tip, we can then generate an image. So how do we uh, couple this together? Because basically, uh, it's not only putting an AFM system and a Raman spectrometer together and, and, and shining light to, to the tip. It's actually, uh, to, to get the performance, uh, you, you need to be careful about many factors. 
so first of all, uh, excitation and collection optics are very critical. Uh, I will go over that. Which method is used uh, will give you uh, a different advantage and uh, inconvenient depending on, the, on uh, what the scanning probe microscope method you use. Uh, the laser tip alignment is obviously critical. I'll go over that. And also uh, acquisition scanning speed uh, will uh, really uh, uh, help improving uh, spatial resolution. And uh, often uh, overlooked point is the tip replacement and how uh, critical it is to be able to come back to the same spot once you change tip. So uh, this has been covered a, a, already a little bit in the previous presentation, but basically the high numerical aperture optics objective lenses will give you a tighter spot on the tip, which provides a better contrast in, in terms. And also another, another thing that's uh, not been mentioned is that it gives you much higher collection efficiency. So if your lens has a higher aperture, your collection efficiency, so the efficiency of the, the, the amount of signal you're collecting is much higher. Which, and that goes with the square of the numerical aperture of your objective. So it's very important to try to get the highest numerical aperture objective you can to illuminate the tip and collect the, the signal. So in order to illuminate the probe tip, you need to have proper optical access to the tip and not all AFMs or SPM system are able to uh, give you that access for, for optical coupling. So that's a, that's a critical point. Um, the best solution to collect as much light as possible is using an inverted microscope. Uh, I don't have fancy uh, superhero cartoons, I only have the little smiley faces here. Um, but uh, basically, uh, with an inverted microscope, you can put your scanning probe microscope on top and uh, have bottom access uh, with the inverted microscope with the very high NA objectives. Like all immersion objectives are able to uh, get to NAs of uh, like 1.45, 1.49 uh, to, uh, with some microscope manufacturers. They tend to get very expensive at that point. Uh, you have to use oil immersion to, to get to these kind of numeric apertures, but it is possible and that gives you a very high uh, collection efficiency. One of the issues, of course, is that the samples need to be transparent because you need to have, be able to shine the light through the sample to get to uh, the tip and, and, of course, the sample on top of the, of the substrate. Um, actually, I would say a lot of nano objects are actually transparent to light if you, if you think about it. I mean, a nanotube, uh, it, might be, it might look opaque if you have a, a whole coating of it on a slide, um, but a single nanotube is pretty transparent to light. So it's really coming down to the substrate. And so if your nano objects are on a transparent substrate, uh, like a mica or even, uh, even a very thin uh, uh, coating of metal, uh, often it's going to be transparent to light. So you should think of uh, the inverted microscope not just for transparent samples, but transparent substrate. Okay, so then for opaque samples, um, basically uh, top illumination is one choice. Uh, that can accept fairly high NA objectives. Of course, you s always need a, a decent working distance to be uh, able to bring the tip under the objective. There's, of course, uh, an issue uh, using standard tips or standard cantilevers that will uh, uh, shadow the tip if you illuminate from the top and uh, you have a regular cantilever. Uh, illuminating the bottom of the tip is not that easy. Uh, if you have a fairly high NA uh, objective, the light will come at an angle and you might be able to reach the tip, but you definitely don't collect all the light you could because of the shadow. So in that case, it's recommended to use uh, protruded tips or extended tips or transparent probes. Okay, so uh, uh, another big issue is that not all uh, SPM system offer that top access and, uh, and often uh, also uh, AFM system especially have optics in the way that they use to bring the feedback uh, laser in place, etc. So all these optics will lower your throughput in terms of optical uh, signal collection. And so the, the, the selection of probe is more limited in that case. 
So a better solution for a big sample is to illuminate from the side at an angle. So by using uh, oblique illumination uh, or uh, what we call off-axis illumination, basically we uh, are able to illuminate the bottom of the tip. You see the cantilever, regular cantilever coming from the top would, would shadow uh, the bottom of the tip, which is the part we want to illuminate. So coming from the side, we're able to illuminate the bottom. Uh, so we don't have shadowing issues in this case. The, we still need a very long working distance objective, so the numerical aperture tends to be lower in that case. Uh, but it's still more efficient uh, for using standard tips. And, and one of the reasons is because, as you see here, the light coming off from the side is not directly uh, scattered back into the objective. It's actually going to be reflected over there. So the far field signal, which we want to eliminate to get the contrast, uh, is not as intense coming from the side and it is coming from the top. In, on the top configuration, uh, you have direct backscattered light that you collect and you get more of that far field signal. Also coming this way, because most lasers are linearly polarized, uh, it's easy to come with the right polarization to have a vertical polarization uh, orientation on, on the tip, uh, which gives you better enhancement. So, uh, of course, you know, if you have access to multiple optical ports, it's even better because you have more choices, you have more ability to work on more samples. And so uh, we have solutions with the side illumination, top illumination, or all three in, uh, in one setup, which allows you to work on both transparent sample, uh, opaque samples, and a variety of probes. Um, so in terms of the... Uh, scanning probe microscope method uh, to use AFM, atomic force microscopy, is one of the most uh, popular technique to do uh, uh, near field uh, imaging. Um, one of the issues with that is the, the feedback uh, is usually done with the laser. Uh, so uh, using that laser and shining it on the tip while you're trying to collect light can be a problem if it's in the same range as the, the Raman signal you're trying to detect. So uh, in uh, as much as you can, you want to stay away from that, from that range. A lot of those diodes are uh, between, let's say, 630 nanometers and uh, 980 nanometers or so, so in the red to near IR. So it's best to use a diode that's further in the IR if possible which allows to uh, basically be totally invisible from the detector, uh, the Raman detector. So uh, with a diode at like uh, 1,300 nanometers, like uh, uh, some manufacturers use, um, it's possible to basically cover the whole range from you know, the, the blue range to the near IR uh, with the, with the uh, regular CCD detector without interference from uh, the AFM feedback diode. So that's, that's uh, the most common issue with that. Uh, STM, the scanning tunneling microscopy method, basically, uh, where you look at the, the, the tunneling voltage through the sample, is a great way to control the tip sample distance. So people using that method are usually pretty, uh, pretty successful doing TERS, uh, using like gold wire as the tip that's been etched in a certain way. Um, so that gives you great control of the tip sample distance. The tip sample distance is obviously very important to, um, to uh, control the enhancement because the closer you get, the better the enhancement. It's actually exponential. Uh, it decays exponentially as you go away from the surface. So the closer you are, the better. But also you don't want to crash your tip because you lose the enhancement completely then. Uh, the advantage is no optical interference. The disadvantage is it's only for conductive samples. Then there's a tuning fork uh, method, which is also uh, pretty common in TERS. It's more versatile uh, in the sense there's no optical interference and it's able to work with conductive, uh, non-conductive samples. Uh, but um, uh, it's also slower in response, so more, uh, more, a bit more difficult. Um, the laser tip alignment is critical. Uh, we basically scan the tip. Here is a representation of the, the laser scan across the tip. We see the silicon signal from the tip here, silicon tip, 
uh, showing here, and then the, the third signal is here, and it shows as a hotspot. Uh, the third hotspot is often uh, offset from the apex. I'm going to move a bit faster here because I see the time is running. Uh, a very stable laser tip alignment is critical for this, so you need really a scanner that has some feedback to, to stay in place while you're doing the imaging. Once you are, uh, the laser and tip are aligned, then you can scan the sample in that case. Okay, so here we have an example of DNA I'm going to show a bit later. Uh, it's also interesting to, uh, in terms of acquisition speed, it's important to go as fast as you can because of possible drift. At those scales, the drift is a problem for spatial resolution. The limitation factor is often the, the detection of the Raman signal. Uh, EMCCDs are useful to go faster and detect signal that are below the, the read noise level. And using multiple sources uh, is useful. So tip replacement, I say it's often overlooked. Uh, you know, if you spend time looking and finding a sample and you scan for an hour to find a piece of DNA, uh, then your tip might be worn out by then and then you don't have any more TERS enhancement. So you spent that hour looking for that a piece of DNA and then you need to change tip and you're totally at a different place. Well, you have to start over. So it's very important to uh, find a, a, a setup that has uh, the ability to come back to the same spot. And there's ways to realign the tip by using the laser of the FM as the reference instead of you know, placing your tip and aligning the laser on the tip. You would actually place, align the tip on the laser that stays fixed and you come back to the same spot. Also being able to track the sample as you move the tip back into the laser beam is a, is a way to keep track of where you were on the sample. So th these are more process uh, method, but that's important to not waste time uh, looking for the sample again. So a few results uh, to finish. Uh, some uh, nanoparticles on the porous silicon that were done with the uh, AISTNT. Here showing, I mean, this was kind of the first results, uh, TERS results we got on that setup and uh, showing resolution of about 100 nanometers. So below the diffraction limit, still not the greatest resolution, I would say, but pretty good. Uh, these are some uh, example of a, a self-assembled monolayer that are grafted on a, uh, on a gold surface. This was done in STM mode with a gold wire on a, on a Park EFM actually at the Ecole Polytechnique uh, in Paris. Um, so this is the, the TERS map here and uh, it shows domain sizes that are in the order of 20 nanometers here. We have uh, done these DNA measurements that I showed earlier. Uh, again, the image is maybe not the, the greatest uh, resolution, but uh, the, the DNA, when you do just the FM image, shows up as about two, three nanometers. When you do TERS, it's slower, so you see it tends with the drift to show as more like 10, 15 nanometers. And this is the, the resolution we get with the, the TERS signal. Uh, and finally, one uh, the most interesting uh, result that I've seen uh, published uh, recently, uh, it's actually not an image, unfortunately, but it's a, it's a profile of a single amyloid fibril uh, by uh, Dr. Deckert in uh, uh, University of Vienna in Germany. And it's using an inverted microscope and is using actually a pretty unique uh, uh, technique he developed to uh, deposit gold flakes on a slide. So there are very thin gold flakes that are acting as, a, as another, uh, as a substrate which interact with the tip to give even more enhancement. So you have a, what's called a gap mode uh, here happening and uh, he's looking at this single fibril. So by scanning the tip he, he, across the fibril, he gets all the spectra and you can identify the different constituent of the uh, amino acids, so the amide bands, H2 uh, phosphate, etc. And if you reconstruct, again, the profile uh, and uh, by using the bands of each amino acid, uh, he shows here a resolution that is about one and a half to two nanometers. So this is, uh, to date, as far as I know, the best uh, resolution that was achieved with the TPNS Raman. And so just to conclude, the TPNS Raman is a, is a developing technique that's being pretty popular these days. Uh, it has proven ability to provide chemically, chemically specific information on the nanoscale and again without labels. 
uh, the hardware development provide optimized uh, uh, platform for, for this uh, technique. And uh, again, the, the key part is uh, manufacturing reliable tips. And uh, there's a lot of published papers on this and uh, uh, many successful people. So uh, it's still to be uh, manufactured as a, as a commercial product, but it's coming. So thank you very much. And uh, hope I didn't go too far across, over. <laughs> Any questions? Right, yeah. uh, to also comment to keep in mind, just this notion of now using the chip as an antenna or as a, a detector, in essence, as a way of getting to the nanoscale. Uh, I mean, this is one particular example of that, but I've seen strategies now where people have been using, for example, IR radiation samples and using the heat generated at the chip as a way yes. in high spatial resolution. Uh -huh. so yeah. I'm just thinking a little bit about the there, there's on the market. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, there's a, a nan, nano IR. I mean, this is Tipenes Raman is also called nano Raman uh, often. Uh, so there's nano IR techniques as well, like you say, looking at the, the heat generation uh, motion by the tip, which gives you 50, 100 nanometer kind of resolution for IR, which is good because IR usually it's more like 20, 30 microns you get with regular IR. Uh, there's also techniques I've seen doing FT uh, IR with AFM, and I've heard of people working on uh, terahertz also uh, with uh, tip tip enhancement. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot uh, still a lot to develop, and we are working. I mean, at Horiba, we are working on on building the platform to to bring those techniques uh, in the lab. Thank you.